Good, good evening, wine lovers, and welcome to the Save SA Wine live stream. Um, we're back after a bit of uh, load shedding. The last uh, we missed uh, this morning and last night because of um, extreme load shedding, but um, we're back. We're back live, and um, things are um, going going well. I mean, it's uh, tomorrow's Friday. It's weekend, and um, we're right in the midst of our 60 and uh, in 1660 campaign. Um, as you guys know, we're busy with this campaign. And um, just before I go into that, I just want to say our um, our featured producer tonight is uh, Blackpool Wines. Um, um, this is a picture of Mary Lou Nash, uh, but I'm going to talk about them um, a bit later. So, what is the 60 in 60 campaign? Well. We will be featuring one South African wine producer, producer a day for the next 60 days. And um, this was from the 30th of August. So we're a few days in now. And it goes on until the 28th of October. So we want everybody to get involved with this um, project and this campaign. Um, please follow these producers. Share their posts. And if you can, buy from them. We need your help. Um, we using the hashtags. Hashtag 1660. We use the hashtag Save SA Wine and we use the hashtag Drink South African. And um, here is why we need your help. Um, as we all know, South Africa had a recent nationwide prohibition on the sale of alcohol and Vintpro estimates that over 90% of your wineries are in trouble. Um, the entire wine industry could lose more than 15% of your wineries, 12.6% of your grape growers, and we are in danger of losing more than 18,000 jobs over the next year and a half. Wine tourism, one of the biggest earners of um, uh, uh, revenue for the country and a foreign exchange, lost 2.5 billion rand in revenue between March and July 2020. And to top it all off, the wine industry is sitting on a 300 million, rand, uh, 300 million litre surplus of wine and the harvest that's coming. And this is going to really um, create some challenges for the, for the industry. We know that the domestic ban has been lifted on the 18th of August, but we had five months of extreme damage. And um, this could put the nail in the coffin for many wine producers. So we really urge you guys, please support us. Please support um, uh, the wine producers please support the hashtag 1660 campaign um, go to the, our website the website is savesawine.co.za I'm going to repeat that that's savesawine.co.za there's a producer calendar on the website and then please go to Instagram on Instagram we want you to um, to actually um, go to instagram.com forward slash save sa wine .co .za. please leave a comment we appreciate all comments please share the posts uh, please like our instagram page i'm going to repeat this instagram.com forward slash save sa wine now back to our um, featured uh, producer of tonight um, our producer like i said is a blackpool wines um, blackpool wines is a winery owned and operated by the nash family um, they relocated from Maine in the United States in 1995 to, um, to Paul, and um, their wines are made in the vineyard, and the, the, the focus is on producing limited quantities of high quality, limited quantities of wine from high quality grapes. And um, from the berry to the bottle is a complete hands-on family experience. Mary Lou Nash in the picture here, is, she's the chief winemaker. She does everything in the vineyards. She's a tractor driver, the marketer, and as she calls herself, the general Jill of all trades at Blackpool Vineyards. Um, the name Blackpool um, was inspired by, of course, Paul Rock, as Paul Rock resembles a black pill after it has rained, as people that live in Paul all know. And of course, black pills are also rare and very valuable. But to see more of um, this winery, to support them, go to blackpillwines.com. That's one word, blackpillwines.com. Please support Mary Lou Nash. 
please support Black Pearl Wines. Um, and then uh, just before we go on to our featured podcast, we just want to say a big thank you to our sponsor of this evening, Livestream. Um, our sponsor is the Fishwives Club. And um, as you can see here, um, they have a new uh, merchandise available in the Fishwives Club boutique. They've got free shipping um, in South Africa. These look fantastic. And you can get this at the Fishwives Club boutique.com. I'm going to repeat that the Fishwives Club boutique.com. Thank you to, to the Fishwives Club for again supporting our evening live stream. Um, yes, tomorrow morning, back, back on the back on the post Friday. It's Friday tomorrow. Lots of exciting things. We're going to look at f- food and wine pairings um, that we can get in the in, in um, the winelands, but more about that tomorrow. Um, Please log in tomorrow morning at um, half past eight um, for our live stream. And then tonight's featured podcast, we're talking to Martin Canbley. Martin is the founder of Planet Wine New Zealand. Um, I interviewed him a few weeks ago. He was born in Germany, grew up in South Africa. And as Martin says, I was lucky enough to attend the University of Cape Town, close to some of the most beautiful and welcoming vineyards and wineries in the world. I started collecting red wines from the exceptional 1978 South African vintage and the seller continues to grow. I've been involved in marketing roles in the wine industry in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand and further afield since 1987. And Martin founded Planet Wine in 2003. So please listen to the podcast. Martin has an interesting story and um, you will really enjoy it. Welcome to About the Winelands. In this show, we will be chatting to leaders, influencers, wine producers, restaurants, and other role players. Tune in every week for our latest episode. You will find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast. Welcome to About the Winelands. Today I'm talking to uh, Martin Canbley from um, Planet Wine, in, all the way from Auckland in New Zealand. Hi Martin, how are you? Hi, well, really well, thank you. And uh, great to be able to speak to everybody in SA and around the world. Well, welcome to About the Winelands. So Martin, um, I, I heard the clinging of glasses in the background. When, 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 uh, tell us a little, before we even start, um, okay. you, have a, you have a secret there. It's eight o'clock in the evening in Auckland. What are you drinking? Yeah, I've got stuck into a 1978 Zandvliet Shiraz, <clears throat> which um, uh, most most of the people listening to this wouldn't have been born when when this wine was made. What's interesting about the wine is that I went to UCT, University of Cape Town, and as a student in 1980, I started buying 1978 vintage wines because I was told <clears throat> that they were worth keeping. And then in those days, there was this story that every second year, so every even year would be a really good vintage. That seems to be some truth in that, because if you think back, I'm, I'm just thinking about Europe, right? And in France, they were saying 2002, which is an even year, and 2010 were good vintages. So. It just shows you it might there might be some truth in that but all the way back to 1978 wow and it's really good seriously this it's surprising Martin, um, this, is, it's, the, the, this is not fair right you can't do this um, <laughs> okay <it's terrible. laughs> you know we've been we've been in there on, on a lockdown we haven't had any wine and now you're pulling out a bottle of 1978 so tell, <laughs> tell me how did you get involved in the um you know in the wine industry Okay, so uh, <clears throat> obviously as a student at Ikey's, we used to go to Stellenbosch all the time on the wine route, just really to drink. But over time, I got to like wine as well and appreciate wine. But then I went back to Joburg and worked up there for a while. And then I wanted to go back to Cape Town, live in Cape Town. And a friend of mine, uh, Jane Martin, who was working at the Cape Wine Academy, uh, sent out my CV to a whole lot of companies. <clears throat> and the only company that actually answered my letter was Gilby's in Stellenbosch. Wow. So I moved to Stellenbosch in 1983. Well, I moved to Cape Town in 1983 and then started working for Gilby's in a marketing role uh, in 1983. Oh, sorry, 87. I'm lying. 
1987, and those were the good years when, when there was still Stellenbosch Farmers Wineries, there was Distel, uh, or uh, distillers, and then we were number three. We were, the, we were the, the small guys, but we were really flexible and really doing really, really well. Those were also the years that the wine routes actually just started to get popular. Yes, I think so. And we, we were mainly a spirits company, but we also had some interesting wineries that we did either did bottling for or distribution for, like Nikki Kruiner of, you know, of Kruiner. And then uh, we had Chamonix, Labrie, uh, Kleiner Zalza we used to own as well at that stage. And Hartenberg we owned as well. Well, we used to, I, w I was at Vasti at that time, and um, we used to get quite a bit of uh, free drinks from Gilby's all the time. So you must have been, you know, especially around the diversity yeah, time. I would have been one of those, yeah. <clears throat> so there you go. So, and then, then you, so you were at Gilby's and um, how did that um, uh, culminate into you actually moving to New Zealand and then starting Planet One? Poor I, so I, I left South Africa in 91 and I traveled around the world for about two and a half years, sort of looking around where, <clears throat> where I could, um, start some you know start my life again <clears throat> and initially went to south america for about a year and then thought no well i can't live there and i ended up in australia because i have family there and i got a job fairly quickly in australia with penfolds which became south corp in marketing roles again so i was marketing manager for lindemans which is a really big brand and sepult and various other brands okay and then after about four years, I said, nah, okay, uh, I want to move on. And then I found a job with Corbin's Wines in New Zealand. In 1998, I moved to New Zealand. And yeah, I haven't, I've been here 21 years and I haven't looked back. Are you a rugby supporter? Of course. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you're not a New Zealand supporter because then the, call, then the conversation's over. <laughs> I was actually at the R Rugby World Cup last year. I was at the final as well, and uh, I was wearing a green shirt. Amazing. What a, what, what yeah, it was incredible. What a World Cup, right? That was amazing. It was superb. So you started your own business um, when? So um, <clears throat> I started Planet Wine in 2003, so about 18 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, the first wines <clears throat> I imported were actually Karpsacht okay. and then also a winery out of Italy uh, from Chianti Classico. Okay, awesome. So you've been selling South African wines um, right from the beginning? Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that was, you know, mm -hmm. that's what I knew um, a lot of. And there were so few South African wines in New Zealand at that stage. Yeah. So um, um, was it an easy um, um, sell to get um, South African wines into New Zealand? I was wondering, you know, how competitive um, South African wines um, could actually be in um, New Zealand? Well, from a competitive point of view, <clears throat> especially now, let's talk about now. So mm -hmm. what you've got at, at in the supermarkets, um, you've got Obiqua sitting at maybe $6.00. <clears throat> and then Niederberg at times at about 10 or $12. So that's really cheap in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So you've got, they're competing on a price point there and it's not about South Africa there. It's about a price point and okay. a wine that's okay at a price point. But at the higher level, <clears throat> South Africa can compete, but it has to be on quality. And that just takes time for people to, you know, to be able to taste the wines. And a really planted wine is the only only import and distributor that has a big portfolio of South African wines. There are a couple of other people who have maybe one brand, uh, like someone has De Morgenson, but they have no other brands. I don't think they've ever been to South Africa. So it's very difficult for them to tell the story with authenticity. So um, from, a, from a producer point of view, right? I mean, um, in a country like New Zealand um, is, a, is a rich country. So I, I suppose the wine market can be quite, even though there's not a huge population, the wine market can actually be quite big and quite lucrative. Um, how, do you, how, how do you actually, if you're a producer, what do you do to get your brand noticed in New Zealand? What, 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 do you, what would you be looking for from a producer? Okay, so if, if I were a South African wine producer <clears throat> and 
I suppose number one, you'd say, why would you go? Why would you attempt to get into New Zealand if you haven't already uh, got into, you know, all the other more lucrative markets, whether that's Europe, Holland, Germany, England, US, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe Hong Kong, Singapore as well. <clears throat> but if you do decide to get into New Zealand, because it is a it is a good wine market, um, two things. Number one is find a good distributor someone who's going to do the work for you, not just sell your wine, but actually tell your story and do the work. And then number two is visit. You've got to visit, visit, visit. And because people buy into people, you know, there's a lot of wine around, there are a lot of wineries around, but if you come and you, people hear your accent, you're different, they get to know you and you come every two or three years after a while you build a loyal following. And that's really, and it's simple. It's really simple, but you know, you've got to do the work. So, before COVID, actually, both Brewer, Ratz, and Chris Mullineux were going to come over this year. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, you know, sadly, those plans have been scuppered, but hopefully next year. So do you arrange like a, almost like a, a, a mini roadshow for these guys when they come over? Yeah, definitely. Yes. So I sell, I, you know, I import from 15 different countries around the world. I import a huge number of different brands, a lot of South African brands, but what I and I sell all over New Zealand, mainly to good restaurants and good wine shops. <clears throat> so when someone comes here for, let's say five days or seven days, I would arrange d dinners with consumers and restaurateurs and then trade visits as well. You know, where we get all the trade together to come to one place where we can show all the wines and, you know, and the winemaker can tell their story. I think that was my next question, you know, from a producer side, if the guy's sitting there and thinking, okay, well, this guy can help me get into New Zealand. How do you, how are you going to pick the guy that you're going to work with? And, and you know, what, what do you want to see the producer commit to? And how does he get into your shop? Well, there's a, uh, so I don't, Planet Wine doesn't have a shop. <clears throat> so I do have a wine shop, but it's called something else. It's Khan and Finley. So okay. it's a separate business, but uh, let's not talk about a shop. How does someone get into my portfolio? Mm -hmm. um, it's because I have so many South African brands in the portfolio already. Uh, there has to be a, a gap. There has to be a niche that they can fit in either by region or by the style of wine they produce. Not so much about price point because I tend to focus more on premium products. So um, I, I generally, I have a, if you like, I have a pyramid, call it a, a pinotage pyramid with cheaper wines at the bottom and more expensive wines at the top. And then on the other axis, I would have the style. So the big old traditional style of pinotage or the Liberté, that type of thing, or, or Kunz wines on the right hand side, the really lighter, the more the Pinot Noir style. <clears throat> so in that whole matrix if there's a big gap somewhere i'd say mm, i actually need a pinotage that sits let's say retail between 18 and 25 dollars and what style do i need and then i would look around you know i would look around for a winery and the same with chenon blanc uh, because those are really the two if you like south african mm. grape varieties that's right. I think Shannon is 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 making yeah, is one of the uh, varieties that can actually make an impact into the future. Sure. Um, and very little Shannon planted in South Africa. So people are, you know, if if anything, then there's Shannon from from yeah from the Loire, and mm -hmm. then it's South African Shannon, and people are getting getting to know the South African Shannon, and it has such a diverse range as well, from really minerally all the way through to quite fruity. You're also selling spirits and liqueurs, but I, I noticed that I didn't see that any brands from South Africa is um, uh, on that list. Yeah, the only, what, what I do bring in is <clears throat> a bit of brandy, but from Karpzicht. Uh, but that's only because they are, you know, one of the wineries I deal with anyway. The challenge with South Africa, <clears throat> sorry, with New Zealand, um, is that brandy is very small and South Africa brandy is very big. So, you know, KWV is here in the market. Someone else is importing KWV. So I will have that in my shop. But other, and there's uh, Richel Yu and Clip Drift and a couple of those, but, but Brandy's not big here. I have spoken to <clears throat> gin distilleries like Inveroche and Blind Tiger. Um, so at some stage I'd like to do that, but the challenge in New Zealand is that we do not have bonded warehousing. 
Oh my word. For, yeah. for imported product. So our excise duty would be around like for a 750 ml bottle at 43% alcohol, our excise duty just on one bottle would be about $17. Wow. So if you think of, let's say I'm buying something at $10 and you add freight and everything else. And by the time you add the importer margin and then the wholesaler margin, it gets to be really expensive. But also if you're bringing in a pallet of, of spirits, I have to basically pay up front the sales tax and the excise duty. So mm -hmm. it's a big investment. And then it takes time you know, to sell the product as well. So for the time being, no, but in the future, I will. I also had a chat to Larry Berger. Do you know him? No, actually, I don't. He has, he has the rooibos tea liqueur. Oh, yes, yes. I've heard about this. Yeah, yeah so I had a, had a good meeting with him as well. And again, pri sometimes the pricing, yeah, South Africans are very surprised when they see the pricing of South African wine in New Zealand because they're like, my God, that's incredibly high. But also, you know, South African wineries aren't stupid. You know, the prices that they sell their wines at in South Africa is a lot lower than the export prices. Yes. You know, and that's just, that's just good commercial sense. Yeah, I mean, you have to adapt yourself to the market you're in, right? I mean, I yeah. think also, yeah. is that the reason why some, in some markets, they actually rebrand the wines as well to, to actually have different um, brands and stuff? Oh, I, I, I don't know where that happens, but <clears throat> what, um, what does happen sometimes is that for different channels, like for the on-premise, like for restaurants, whatever, they may have a diff may have the same wine, but with, you know, that goes into retail, but they'll have a different label that'll go mm -hmm. into restaurants. So people can't, can't compare. Yeah, I've seen that happening in the US and in Ireland where people actually actually uh, do, um, you know, they, they, they actually label the wine specifically for the market. Yeah. But um, so your, your own sales, um, do you only sell in New Zealand or do you actually sell regional in Australia as well? I'm just thinking about this excise duty problem. Well, if, every now and then, because there's not much South African wine in Australia. So every now and then I do have people contacting me when they're searching for certain wines. And every now and then I do send over maybe a six pack or 12 bottles of wine to somewhere. I'm actually just in the process of sending 30 bottles of wine to Hong Kong okay. <clears throat> to, to a guy who's just discovered South African white blends from the Swartland. So he's incredibly excited. So he doesn't, he doesn't really care. He just wants the wine. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm sending him some uh, of some Tafutpat from Evan Saadi, then some of uh, Adi Baden horse wines, and then some of the Malinu as well, white blend. Oh, very interesting. So, uh, Martin, the, I mean, you must have had quite an uh, experience also with the coronavirus, and this has forced everyone to rethink their business models. Um, do you have any changes or new ideas in mind? Um, most probably something that was happening anyway, which is the whole online buying thing. So from, from two sides, one is the consumers much more happy now, much more trusting now to buy online. And then the other one is that, that every company that actually, well, number one, you have to have a website and you have to have systems in place to supply your customer quickly and in a good way and that also their interface you know the interface the website interface is really easy to use but that's something that's been happening anyway all i think is coronavirus has accelerated that process i think that's a worldwide trend i mean i'm direct consumer has been a trend in in all retail not only yeah. in wine yeah. because the internet yeah. takes out the middleman and um, I was wondering if that all, um, you know, like you say, your, uh, currently your, your South African wine producer would not really talk to his end customer in any shape or form. He would rather see the distributor as his end customer. I'm, I'm talking to the actual drinker, the guy that actually consumes the wine in the end, the consumer. And um, how do, um, um, if, if, I mean, is there space for brand building, for instance, where guys actually go on a campaign to actually talk to the consumers that actually drink their product? Um, th th I think that's quite a small segment of the market. You mm -hmm. know, the people who are that interested in, in wine that they really want to 
speak to or listen to the winemaker. I mean, that, those people are there, but it's, and then it's, you've got to ask the question whether it's really worthwhile doing in terms well, of the effort involved in the time. I'm involved. talking more um, um, about communication from the brand, not necessarily okay. about uh, a quality or the, or the winemaker or technical. No, that's, that's important, really important, especially what I've found now that I've got a wine shop as well. I've found that, you know, Facebook is, is quite good for telling stories and for people to have a bit of time, but Instagram is really the one where, you know, it really gets people, drives people to action. So oh, really? Instagram is really good. And the other thing that I've been discussing with Chris Molyneux is that um, once we're out of lockdown again, we have a bit more space and we can have events that we will actually do a Zoom tasting with his wines, where he will, where, you know, he'll be on Zoom in South Africa, let's say in the morning, and we'll be sitting there with wine, 10, 20 people with, the, with his wines, and he can talk us through his wines. We oh, did one of those already um, about six or eight weeks ago with uh, Craig Hawkins from Testalonga. Okay. So we did we did one of those Zoom tastings with him. I think those things are, are getting more important because if you think back, right, yeah. just thinking about marketing, I mean, the guys in Champagne, the, the French guys have been so good in telling their stories, right? Everybody knows yeah. some other story about a widow, a, a widow selling Champagne or saving the winery or yeah. whatever and, and i think that's something that our guys can can learn from is um, that storytelling yeah. of the brand is extremely important yeah now the thing is with champagne <clears throat> they obviously they they're big machines they mm. have big marketing budgets and they have a big team of people who can do that with you know with i'd say with most south african and new zealand wineries they are so small that they don't really have the resources to do everything. So they're winemakers, they're viticulturists, they're the marketing people, they are the accountant, and there's maybe three or four people doing everything, you know? It's, it's is, hard. Is, it's isn't, hard. isn't social media a bit of a leveler in this case? Because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much less expensive um, uh, way to get yes. to um, people to notice you than it is to run an a old traditional media campaign. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, and it's quite easy to do. Yeah, I mean, it just requires a little bit of a take a photograph and come up with a line, and there you go. But you've got to do it regular, regularly and con, you know, consistently. So I'm just thinking in South Africa, we're coming up to um, the first of September, which is also Capta Sick Day. The you know the MCC, the local bubbly. Mm -hmm. um, how uh, is that? Uh, is that something that that sells um, where you are? Is it something that people are trying to sell? Um, I, I import the Haute Cabrera or the Pierre Jourdain wines. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough call. What you've got is obviously you've got Champagne, mm -hmm. then you've got Prosecco, which is massive. <clears throat> then you've yeah. New Zealand produced because of the cooler climate. New Zealand produces really, really good um, sparkling wine as well. Then you've got Cava, and then <clears throat> you're trying to create another category and a presence for you know south african sparkling it's it's a the wines are really good but it's a tough job yeah i was i was wondering about that yeah oh that's quite interesting so martin um i mean you've had quite an interesting wine journey so what is the most important thing that you've learned in this journey um for me there, there, there are no shortcuts um do your research so what I do is I go to the wineries, I meet the people, I kick the soil, I see, I see the vineyards, and I look the people in the eye, shake their hand. And it's really important for me is building the relationships and knowing that in five or 10 years time, I still want to go and spend time with that person and talk about wine, but not only wine. You know, wine for me is, um, it's really the juice or the glue that, that holds my life together. So it's about cultures, it's about people, it's about languages, it's about food, it's about stories. And um, that's, that's the important part for me. For me is travel and meet the people. Um, I, at times I've just imported something some time ago without meeting people. They've sent me samples and I've just gone for it and it just hasn't worked generally. Mm. Well, like you said right in the beginning, business is about people, right? Yeah, and it's patience, you know, patience. Mm. and. Um, yeah, and, and understand the terroir, understand what, you know, what, what the people are doing and what the philosophy is as well. Um, and it's important that, you know, 
I understand that philosophy and that I, I can either live with it or I actually agree with it as well. Well, now that we're talking about philosophy, we need to get personal. I, I really have to ask uh-huh. a very, very personal question, and that is, um, how is that Shiraz tasting? I tell you what, I'm amazed how, I shouldn't say this, because it's going to get people green around the gills, but mm-hmm. this is still, I, I thought it would actually, because we've been talking for a while, and I thought it would have actually fallen over a little bit, but mm. it's amazing. I wish, I wish I could send you, send you a little doppy. I wish I, I wish I were, I mean, yeah, I wish I, we could, I, techno, once technology can do that, then I mean, yeah, I mean, true, that's true, for true. sure. But I'll tell um, you what, mm-hmm. color is amazing. It's deep and dark. I can believe that. Yeah. So definitely wow. send me a few pictures over and um, even if you want to shoot, yeah. if, even if you want to shoot a short video, we'll definitely put it on your group. So <laughs> Martin, um, to, to end off with, I ask everybody yeah. to give us um, their favorite uh, or their own wine quote. What is yours? And I, I was looking at that and I didn't want to use anybody else's. Yeah, there's so many good wine quotes around, <clears throat> but it, I think I've already mentioned it earlier on it is that you know wine is the juice that holds my life together that oils my wheels and gears you know that's sort of a a a quote that sort of if you picture it and the big machine and or maybe the bones and everything else and all the joints and everything and that you can just see the wine the red red wine when i think of this juice i'm thinking of red wine and it's just running through and it gets pumped back up again and runs through again so I just think we, we're part of one big family of wine people. And, you know, wine allows me to travel, make friends, learn, and all the while eat and drink merrily. And that, you know, that's it. What more can I want? Well, that's amazing. You know, it's, it's, it's such a blessing if you can actually do what you love and what you're passionate about. So, yep. so that's great. So true. Yeah. Martin, um, if people want to get hold of you, um, how, do they, how do they get hold of you? So... Most probably the easiest would be just by email. Mm-hmm. So, so um, just anything you want to say in front of at planetwine.co.nz. Okay. It's, like, it's like a catch-all. If you want to say <clears throat> Flixum or Fuspate or whatever you want to do at planetwine.co.nz. It's most probably the easiest. Mm-hmm. Or otherwise, just jump on the website, so planetwine.co.nz, and okay. that's it. And, and, and yeah, both Facebook and Instagram are just NZ Planet Wine. Okay, well, we'll put all the links in the description. Martin, oh, it's, cool. been, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, you've really, uh, it was quite interesting. You've made me jealous with your wine, that's <laughs> for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, have a great evening, and uh, thanks for spending the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> very, very lucky to chat and be able to. Um, yeah, you made me think a little bit about as well, and it's great to have those questions beforehand to prepare a little bit. But it's yeah, it's um, you know, SA is an amazing country, amazing people, friendly people, and yeah, I just hope you know next year we'll look back and say yes, like thank God that's over, I and then have so. a great glass of wine. I, I think things change. Right? I, I was stuck with Ash Cloud. For six weeks, couldn't fly, and we thought we were never going to fly again, right? And then six weeks later, it was over. I think, you know, things will go back to normal eventually. They will, yes. And, and okay. we'll all be different. Thanks, Martin. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Well, all the best, Tim. Hey? Thank you. Thank you for supporting our show. If you would like to get more exposure for your business, please have a look at our sponsorship options. Thanks again for supporting About the Winelands. Please follow us on YouTube and on your social media channels. All details and links are in the description.